Thank you. Yes. Let's stay together and feel all right. <laughs> I think it was a very good beginning of our ceremony this afternoon. I'm not good in protocol. I want to acknowledge parents. I want to acknowledge the supporters of the academy. I want to acknowledge the academic staff, administrative staff. I want to, more importantly, acknowledge you, students because we are the reason why this institution exists and that we are the reason why we're here today. I want to also lower your expectations. I'm not going to give a keynote address. I am a grandmother and I'm going to talk to my grandchildren, have a conversation with them. Let's begin by what this institution is called, African Leadership Academy. And I want to ask each one of you to have a time of searching very deeply and Make a conscious re encounter with yourself and say, What does it mean to you to be African? Why are you African? What does it make you distinctive and different from other young people in the world? And I actually think this defines the very reason why this institution was established, is to deepen our understanding and the ability to revisit ourselves, to reclaim our identity as African peoples and to take pride of who we are and take responsibility of shaping forms, colors, sounds of who we are to be known to the rest of the world but have been having been defined, molded, internalized, and projected by ourselves. This may sound a little bit theoretical, but it, I would really ask you to take the time privately to write down five reasons why each one of you believe you are an African. Do it for yourself, but also do it for this institution. So first, you're going to exchange among yourselves what you have come up as your personal reason to believe I am an African. Second, I'll ask you to share this with the academy, to send it back. Because I think at the essence of how to perfection the vision and the mission of this institution, it's crucial to those 
who continue to work with different classes who are coming here to hear from you why you believe you are an African and what makes you distinctive. Maybe my English is the, it's not, what makes you unique as African? I'm talking of African identity. It's not simply because we happen to have been born on this part of the planet. There is something much more profound and deep which links us to a huge wealth of heritage, of values, value systems, of way of being, which is African, and it's different from other ways of being by other human beings, by other peoples. And I think reclaiming our identity as Africans, and particularly in our young generations, it is probably the most fundamental issues which we have to be sure that we have touched the soul, the soul of being African. And then what, whatever else we are to do, it will be all right. But if we don't touch our own soul, and we are able of owning it, and to be absolutely sure that this, this is who we are, we can train, we can touch whatever the world has to offer, but we had, would have failed exactly in one of the most fundamental issues of our times. So this is first. The second is leadership. I know that you have been from the time you applied to come to this institution, you knew you were coming for an institution which will train you to be leaders. And of course, you are convinced now that you are leaders. And I want to ask you to be humble. Leadership, or rather, you were privileged to have a whole range of uh, science, of knowledge, of techniques, even of uh, investment to prepare you to become leaders. But I want to say to you, let's uh, you are still going to prove yourself whether you are to be leaders or not. You will most probably become very influential in whatever is the sector of your choice. Definitely because you have been privileged to have the kind of education and the foundations you take from this institution. I have no doubt that you will be, you'll make a difference and you'll be influential. But that doesn't mean necessarily that you are going to be leaders. You have to make yourself leaders. And more importantly, you have to be aware that leadership is a quality which is recognized by the community you serve. And it's up to the community to recognize you as a leader. It's not you who present yourself as a leader. Okay? So, 
I know we, 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 it's, it's, it's our responsibility as, as a society, and we have been talking of leadership in a, my view many times with a, a very light kind of, you know, of approach. And I'm going to be very, very direct. We talk of all the people who are in position of power, particularly heads of state, and we say they are all leaders. I want to say some are rulers, others are leaders. And that distinction, and that distinction, it's very important. I can even go to the sector, I mean business sector. You have very powerful people who are running, I mean, very important businesses, companies which are global or they are continental or even are small. And because they are in position of power, because the companies they are running, they are CEOs or whatever, and we say leaders, even the business. Uh, sector. They are very, there are many people who are in position of power, who influence actually our lives, but they are not necessarily leaders. So I'm saying this because it's important for you to be very clear about what is the journey you have to walk to use the fundamentals which have been invested in you during your time here to honor that, to honor that investment and to transform yourself into leaders. And this is our hope, not only our hope. I think this is the reason why the founders of this institution they established this institution and they shaped it the way they do. It's because they want amongst many of you to be the leaders of our continent. The other issue which is related to this is that you can only become a leader when you know you know well society you are to serve. And I'm talking of service. And please keep this word again and again. Leadership is related to service, service, and service. Leadership, leadership requires you to know better the people and society you choose, and I'm saying you choose to serve. So it's an option. It doesn't happen by itself simply because you applied to a company, you applied to a university, you applied to a public service, and you were successful, and to say, then it's done. No, you have to choose the way you are going to exercise your knowledge, your skills, your energy, and your talent. You have to choose the way you want to exercise that. So leadership is also an issue of choice. It doesn't happen just because you are in a certain position. So you need to take the time to choose what kind of a leader you want to be, you want to become. And you work hard, really very hard, to become that leader. A continent is very, very diverse. Many, for many of you, the first experience 
of beginning to grasp the magnitude of what Africa is in its complexity and who are the people who compose Africa. For many of you, it may have been the first experience when you came here and you learned that someone who has been born in Kenya, how is identifying himself with someone from Morocco and someone from Ethiopia to identify himself or herself with someone who happened to have been born in Namibia. So your first confrontation with multitude and complexity of what we say African, and I'm going back to my first point of being African, your first confrontation was here. And it lasts only two years. And two years is too short time for you to believe that you have grasped this and you have understood and you have internalized. So this is just the beginning. Give yourself time, I'll go back to my first point, to really crystallize for yourself what it means to be African and give yourself time to understand what it means to embrace and to accept and to have the diversity and complexity of African peoples in one people, one people who has a space in your heart. Because leadership, again, has a lot with our intelligence, our emotional intelligence. Either you feel it or nothing done. If you don't have your heart into it, then forget it. So you need to understand and to embrace, to put these different faces and shapes and, as I said, colors and the songs and sounds all this, to put it in one, and you are able to see it when you close your eyes. And it is, and to say, this is uh, my Africa, and I am African to serve this Africa. Now, are you going to do this alone? No. It is too big. And I know I'm giving you a big task. But what I'm saying is, because you are, quite rightly, I mean, very ambitious, very ambitious young people, what I'm simply saying is that raise high your ambition and make your, that ambition a limited, a limited uh, capacity and ability to learn to enrich yourself and never, never get to a point you believe you know enough. So the ambition which you have to transform, the ambition you have to transform the continent, it means the ambition to transform we, one billion of Africans, and we, the billion of Africans, you know, we are still those of us who don't even have clean water to drink. So those of us who have no idea what electricity is. I mean, when in 21st century, I mean, electricity is the, something which we live with. It means Amongst the billion of Africans, there are those who are still in the 18th century before electricity had been discovered. So, what you have the ambition to transform has to have a very clear baseline of what, what is it what you want to transform as people and as conditions in which people live to understand who the people you want to 
lead in transformation, but what are the conditions you are pledging to transform and then to become an African leader? I think um, one of the issues I would like to, at this point, to insist on is our capacity to accept and not be threatened by diversity. And I'm saying accept. I didn't say to tolerate. As young generation, as young generation, and with the fundamentals which you have acquired here, me, as your grandmother, I expect you to have learned to accept. And because when you accept, then you have the empathy. You see yourself in the other. And then you have the right for the other to see you as equal. And then you accept, we accept each other. We are a society or societies which are still insecure uh, in front of diversity, in front of what is different. And you know, the differences actually are very external, are very fictitious. It's simply because some of us, they cover, they, they had, some of us, they have, um, they dress in a different way. By the way, many of us, we believe that the fact that I'm dressing like this, it's the norm. No, I copied this. I grew up in a situation where I copied to dress, to dress like this. But there's nothing, there's nothing, nothing African about the way I'm dressing. <laughs> so, it is to say, sometimes we, we are caught up in comparisons which have nothing to do with our identity. It's just things which happen to have been taken as part of uh, our life and you grow up, you, in this case, you grow up being told what is normal, what is abnormal, but you never had the time to critically ask, is it really what defines an African? And that's what I'm asking you, to take the time to think of. That's when I talk about, I mean, appearance. Other kind of differences is how people do pray. Some will pray standing. Others will be kneeling. Others believe in God. Others, they believe in Allah. Others, they believe in ancestors. And many, many times, actually, uh, the same people, same person would be believing in different kind of gods at the same time. But it's simply because in the way they express uh, respect and reverence and actually acknowledgement there is, that there is a power which is above all of us, or at least we have not been able to explain by science. And because we have not been able to explain, we know it does exist. And somehow it influences our life. And so we pay respect to that. So what is wrong if some will do it in one language, in another language, in one form or the other? Then we have also the diversity of race. And it looks like it's a small thing, but it's not. We still caught up in the issue of, oh, because this is white, and this is Indian, 
And this is um, colored in the language of South Africa. Huh? It's colored. And this one is koi koi, whatever you want to call it. So what? What is essential? What is essential is the human dignity which exists in every single human being, which makes us equal. Whether your color is this or that, because you look at me, for instance, I mean, I have a light complexion. I remember when I went to university in Lisbon, many people would say to me that I'm, I'm mulatto in Portuguese, which means colored. And I started to say, but why am I colored? It's simply because I have light complexion. So you, can, you see how it can be misleading, even, even in aspects. No, I'm, I'm, it's, it's not like I think it's a, it's a merit, but it happens that I'm just as black as, the, I don't know who else, but I have light complexion. <laughs> so what is it? I'm saying this, it's not really to make you laugh. I'm saying we need to begin to dismantle these things and put them in a way we can put in the way to weigh them and say, is this what really make me different from another human being? Should I invest my emotional intelligence looking at the differences or should I invest in what make me equal and make us common? And this is a very important issue of leadership and that's why I'm raising. It's, these are very important issues of leadership we're talking about. Then we have the issue of gender. Men and women. We understand that because everybody has access to education and we are very sophisticated in the way we talk, but we are not really very sophisticated in, way, in the way we look at a man and a woman and you know, you know, these are equal. Although some will be dressing like I dress and they, they dress that way, they are men, and in essence, in essence, our societies, and actually this is a global issue today, the so-called gender violence, it's endemic, it's endemic also in our societies. I don't want to talk about the rest of the world, but in our societies. And the only reason I can see of this is as society transforms and the issue of power and exercising power begin to shift to put us in a level where we are equal, some feel threatened and they, the response is to be violent. Others, which is women, they are so frightened by the power they hold and they can't exercise it sufficiently to say, hold on, hold on, I'm not a threat to you. And both sides, they are confronted with inability to manage this shifting of what has been tradition in relationship between uh, men and women. And fix my word, I said tradition, I didn't say culture because the interpretation is that, oh, it's cultural, our cultural values. There's no culture which oppresses other human beings. There's no culture. There's no culture which dictates, which dictates that you are going to consider yourself superior or inferior, and because of that, you are going to, to be aggressive to another one. It's not culture, it's tradition. And the traditions and practices are man-made. And because they are man-made, they have to change. And you have. And you have the power. 
you young people, you have the, the power to change it much easier than those who are in their 40s and their 50s, let alone thinking of my generation. Our conviction, those of us who trust you, those of us who love you, those of us who invest on you, is that you are going to be the generation which is going to show us that the tradition change and you take that fundamental change relationship between men and women as serious as you are planning, I mean, to transform business or to transform politics or to transform whatever it is. I'm talking about this because we need to have a sort of a confrontation with the, our inner Sometimes, sometimes they get to a point where they are beliefs, and sometimes it's just uh, misconceptions, and sometimes I just pre. How do you say this in English? You say preconception as well. This is how you say. Mm. But we have to confront them. There's no change. There is no funda fundamental change which is going to happen, or you are going to lead the transformation in our continent if you don't confront also these misconceptions. And that's why I think it's very important for you as you take up the responsibility before your leaders, before your parents, before all of us as Africans to believe that yes, we have crops and crops of young potential young leaders coming up, you have to confront this as well. I don't want to be long. I want to come to the end of my, um, my conversation with you. Is I know that in your day-to-day -day life, you do not have many examples of ethical leadership. You do not have many. And that's why we, we believe we have to transform. It's because we, we know. So, <laughs> please take the time to clarify to yourself as a group what kind and not kind, what quality of leadership you want to set in the journey of African African future. Do not get too influenced by what you see. Question yourself and set for yourself the qualities of leadership which you want to embrace. Of course, you can do that without looking back and taking the good lessons of those who have come before you. But you have to be able to define for yourselves standards of quality which go beyond what you have seen in the past and what you see today. We started here by taking a deep breath to, for the past and the present and the future. The past has to be an important reference where you stand on. You stand on the shoulders of giants, as many times is said, okay? And today, you also have, I mean, good reference of leadership. But the realities of what those who are leaders in the past or today, and the realities of what you have to confront tomorrow, they're not exactly the same. And because 
the young, yes, a continuation of a life of a, a, a continent, yes, they have to become part. But you have to expand your horizons to face the challenges of your time. Because the challenges of your time are not the challenges of Nkrumah. They're not the challenges of Julius Nyerere. They're not the challenges of Mandela we have honored now. They're not the challenges of Albertine Sisulu. And they're not even the challenges of those who are now, uh, I mean, ruling and leading our lives. <laughs> Yours, yours, because I, I was told that they have the, 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 the attention to ask the age average. You are around 19, isn't it? Yeah, you are around 19. Look at yourself and think, in 10 years time, where am I going to be? In 20 years time, where do I want to be? And you remember, you are in a continent where the average of age of more than 40 nations is 17. Okay? You hear me? So the average of citizens of this continent in at least more than 40 countries are much younger than you are. And these are the people you are going to lead. This is your challenge of leadership is looking at that group which is coming. And your preparation then, it is to lift up those millions. And that's why your standards and the ethics, they may be the same, but the ethics have to be applied to a specific reality. So don't take anything for granted and don't take any option, choice, lightly. Because the challenges you have, to be honest with you, are much more complex, much more difficult than ours. Finally, I want to say, you have been, you are really a privileged generation especially you who managed to come to this, to this institution. So, you are privileged. Remember to thank your parents for having nurtured you so that you will have the values which more than just academic achievement, but the values which made you accepted to this institution. It's the families you come from, the communities you come from, which have molded you to be where you are. With the privilege comes responsibility. I'll insist on this. With privilege, comes responsibility. And your responsibility is now to plow back. Choose how you want to, but plow back. Make much more and much better than what your parents have done to prepare you. You have to do much more, much better. And it is also part of honoring them. The honor you can give them is for you to be much better than what they could have aspired when they had you as children and they invested in you. Raise the bar very high. Don't be afraid with all this which I have said, don't be afraid to fly and fly high because not only your parents, this institution which you'll be always related to and many of us who are around who will be always there. That even if while you are flying something goes wrong, you will not fall. 
will be there to hold you and to keep you at the height, to keep you at the height where your potential allows you to reach. So take that privilege and that responsibility with no fear, with confidence. And yes, our continent will be as bright as you are. Thank you.